It's tax time, and last year was a total bust for me. I actually lost money selling these collections at oldtimeradiodvd.com, and obviously I can't afford to lose money. No one can. While I really want everyone to have these collections, not at the low prices, it just can't continue. So if you've ever thought about owning one of these collections, now is the time because they will not be available for much longer. Go to oldtimeradiodvd.com, place your order today oldtimeradiodvd.com You'll be glad you did. I present now The Blanched Soldier, which is another story in our Sherlock Holmes series by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Adapted for radio by Michael, Michael Hardwick. The Blanched Soldier. For a long time, my friend Watson has worried me to write down an experience of my own. I have often had occasion to point out to him how superficial are his own accounts and to accuse him of pandering to popular taste instead of confining himself rigidly to facts and figures. Try it yourself, Holmes, he's retorted. And yes, I'm compelled to admit I do begin to realize that the matter must be presented in an interesting way. By the way, speaking of my old friend and biographer, I would take this opportunity to remark that if I burden myself with a companion in my various little inquiries, it is not done out of sentiment or caprice. Watson has some remarkable characteristics of his own, to which, in his modesty, he has given small attention amid his (coughs) exaggerated estimates of my own performances. The only selfish action I can recall in our association, in fact, was when he deserted me. For a wife. I take it then, Holmes, that you're not altogether gratified by my news. I must confess, Watson, that it comes as a surprise to me, and not altogether a pleasant one. But on the occasion of my previous marriage, you appear to accept, I may even say, welcome the idea. True, true. But as I believe I remarked at the conclusion of that singular episode of The Sign of Four, the late Mrs. Watson was exceptionally gifted in that same field of logical deduction which I happened to have made my own particular province. She was an asset to our partnership, not, as I regretfully fear, the distraction from it that the new Mrs. Watson seems likely to prove. Oh, really, Holmes, I think you exaggerate. The fact that my dear wife-to-be has offered to establish me in a modest West End practice should hardly preclude the continuance of our association. A married man may still retain something of his former interest, may he not? Ah, Watson. For one who boasts of his experience of women in four separate continents, I think I can only remark that your attitude remains singularly ingenuous. But we shall see, Watson. We shall see. I find from my notebook that it was just at the time, January 1903 just after the conclusion of the Anglo-Boer War, that I had my visit from Mr. James M. Dodd. Uh, From South Africa, sir, I perceive. Why, yes, sir. Imperial Yeomanry, I fancy? (laughs) Exactly. Middlesex Corps, no doubt. Mr. Holmes, you're a wizard. When a gentleman of virile appearance enters my rooms, with such a tan upon his face that an English son could never give, and with his handkerchief in his sleeve instead of in his pocket... It is not difficult to place him. You wear a short beard, which shows that you are not a regular. You have the cut of a riding man. As to Middlesex, your card has already shown me that you are a stockbroker from Throgmorton Street. What has happened at Tuxbury Old Park? Mr. Holmes, I... No, my dear sir, there is no mystery. Your letter came with that heading. As you fixed this appointment in very pressing terms, it was clear that something sudden and important had occurred during your visit there. Yes, indeed. But a good deal has happened since that letter was written. If Colonel Emsworth hadn't kicked me out... Kicked you out? Perhaps, Mr. Dodd, you will explain what you're talking about. (laughs) I'd got in the way of supposing that you knew everything without being told. But I will give you the facts. I hope you will be able to tell me what they mean. And pray proceed... Colonel Emsworth was the Crimean V.C., you know. Well, when I joined up in 1901, young Godfrey, his only son, joined the same squadron. I never met a finer lad. The real fighting blood. We formed the kind of friendship you can only make when you both live the same life and share the same joys and sorrows. 
We took the rough and the smooth together through a year of fighting. Then he was hit with a bullet from an elephant gun outside Pretoria. I got one letter from the hospital at Cape Town and one at Southampton. Since then, not a word. Not one word, Mr. Holmes, for six months and more. He was my closest pal. And what then? When the war was over and we all got back, I wrote to his father and asked where Godfrey was. No answer. I waited a bit and wrote again. This time I had a reply. Short and gruff. Godfrey had gone on a voyage round the world, and it wasn't likely that he'd be back for a year. Well, Mr. Holmes, I wasn't satisfied. The whole thing seemed so unnatural. It wasn't like him to drop a pal like that. No, I just wasn't satisfied. Well, what did you do? Well, my own affairs took quite a time to straighten out, so I haven't been able to do anything about it until this week. My first move was to go down to his home at Tuxbury Old Park. I had to walk five miles from the station. It was nearly dark when I got there. But at any rate, when I told the old butler my business, he went straight away and came back and showed me into Colonel Emsworth's study. He was sitting behind his desk waiting for me. Well, sir, I should be interested to know the reasons for this visit. I explained to you in my letter, sir, that I knew Godfrey in Africa. Yes, yes, I know that. Of course, we have only your word for it. I have his letters to me in my pocket. Oh, kindly let me see them. Yeah. We were the closest of friends, sir. Yeah. Is it not natural that I should wonder at his sudden silence and wish to know what has become of him? I have some recollections, sir, but I had already explained that in replying to your letter. He has gone upon a voyage around the world. His health was in a poor way after his African experiences, and I was of the opinion that the complete rest and change were needed. Kindly pass that explanation on to any other friends who may be interested in the matter. Certainly. But perhaps you would have the goodness to let me have the name of the steamer and the shipping line. I have no doubt I should be able to get a letter through to him. Many people, Mr. Dodd, would take offense at your infernal pertinacity. They would consider this insistence to have reached the point of confounded impudence. Then you must put it down to my real love for your son. Exactly, Mr. Dodd. I have already made every allowance upon that score. I must ask you, however, to drop these inquiries. And now, sir, you've come a long way, and you're welcome to stay the night here. My butler, Ralph, will see to your needs. We dine at eight o'clock. Come in. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I just brought you some more coals. Bit of cold it is, sir. Thank you, Ralph. Yes, sir. Now, sir, will there be anything more tonight? No, that's all, thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, before you go, there is just one thing. Sir? You've been in service here a long time, I suppose. Oh, yes, sir. Me and the missus, both. Then you've known Master Godfrey for many years. Oh, Lord bless you, sir. Why, my missus nursed him. You could say, in a manner of speaking, that I'm his foster father. Oh, really? He was a fine boy, all right. And he was a fine man, sir. Was? You you say he was? Uh, look here, what is all this mystery about? What has become of Godfrey Emsworth? Well, I, I, I don't know what you mean, sir. Ask the master about Master Godfrey. It's not for me to interfere. Now listen to me, no, Ralph. No, no. Let go of me, sir. Please, You're please, going now. to answer one question sir. before you leave this room if I have to hold you all night. Is Godfrey Emsworth dead? I wish he was, sir. I wish to heaven he was. Well, after that, there seemed to be only one interpretation, Mr. Holmes. My poor friend had evidently become involved in something criminal, or at least something disreputable that had touched the family honor. His stern old father had sent him away for fear of some scandal coming to light. Or that was what I thought just then. Your problem presents some very unusual features, Mr. Dodd. But pray continue. After the butler had gone, I must have stood there pondering all this for some time. Then something made me look up. And there was Godfrey Emsworth. In the room? No, he was outside the window. It was a ground floor room. I'd left the curtains open. And there he was looking at me through the glass. He was 
deadly pale. I've never seen a man so white. I reckon ghosts may look like that, but his eyes met mine, and they were the eyes of a living man. Did he give any sign? When he saw me looking at him, he sprang back into the darkness. Mr. Holmes, there was something shocking about the man. It wasn't just the ghastly face. It was something, something slinking and furtive, something guilty. It left a feeling of horror in my mind. I assume, however, that when a man has been soldiering a year or two with Brother Boer as his playmate, he keeps his nerve and acts quickly. Exactly. Godfrey had hardly vanished before I was out of that window. I ran down the garden path in the way I thought he would have gone. It seemed to me that something was moving ahead of me. I called his name, but it was no use. When I got to the end of the path, there were several others branching in different directions to some outhouses. But as I stood there hesitating, I distinctly heard the sound of a closing door. It wasn't behind me in the house. It was somewhere ahead, in the darkness. I knew then, Mr. Holmes, that what I'd seen was no vision. You believed he had run away from you and shut the door behind him? I'm certain. Well, hey, Mr. Dodd, what else did you do? Oh, there was nothing more I could do. I spent an uneasy night trying to find some theory to cover the facts. Next day, I found the colonel rather more conciliatory. His wife remarked that there were some places of interest in the neighborhood. I saw an opening to ask whether I might stay one more night. Somewhat grudgingly, he agreed. Which gave you a clear day in which to make your observations. <laughs> well, yes. I felt I must explore the garden and see what I could find. There were several small outhouses, but at the end of the garden there was a detached building of some size. It was heavily curtained. I wondered if this could have been the place the sound of that shutting door had come from. I approached in a careless fashion, strolling aimlessly. As I did so, a small bearded man in a black coat and bowler hat came out of the door. He locked it after him. Then he looked at me with some surprise. Good day, sir. Good day. Are you, uh, are you a visitor here? Yes, I am. My name is Dodd, James M. Dodd. I see. I'm an old army chum of Mr. Godfrey Imsworth. I came hoping to see him. What a pity that he should be away on his travels. He would have been pleased to see you, no doubt, Mr. Dodd. His travels? Exactly. Well, good day to you, sir. No doubt you will resume your visit at some more propitious time. Good day, sir. He passed on. But when I turned, I observed that he was standing watching me half concealed by some laurels at the far end of the garden. So I strolled back to the house and waited for night. As soon as everyone had retired and everything was dark and quiet, I slipped out of my window and made my way as silently as possible to the mysterious lodge. The curtains were still drawn, but now there were shutters up as well. Even so, there was some light coming through at one place. I found I could see inside the room. I saw the little man I'd seen that morning. He was smoking a pipe and reading a paper. I tried to see more of the room, but just then... So, you've become a spy, have you? Uh, Colonel Emsworth. Kindly follow me back to the house, sir. There is a train to London at 8.30 in the morning. The trap will be at the door at 8. Uh, sir, if the I may... matter will not bear discussion. You have made a most impertinent intrusion into the privacy of our family. You were here as a guest, and you have become a spy. I have nothing more to say, sir. Say that I have no wish ever to see you again. Very well, Colonel Emsworth. Only I have seen your son, and I am convinced that for some reason of your own you are concealing him from the world. I have no idea what your motives are in cutting him off in this fashion, but I am sure he is no longer a free agent. I am warning you, Colonel. What that? I warn you that until I am assured of the safety and well-being of my friend... I shall never desist in my efforts to get to the bottom of this mystery. What's and I shall certainly not allow myself to be intimidated by anything you may say or do. I hope be However, he didn't attack me, Mr. Holmes. But there was nothing for it but to take the appointed train, after writing first to ask you to see me. Mr. Dodd, the servants, how many were in the house? To the best of my belief, there was only the old butler and his wife. The family seemed to live in the simplest fashion. There was no servant then in the detached house? Uh, none. Unless the little man with the beard acted as such. 
But he seemed to be quite a superior person. That seems very suggestive. Now, uh, had you any indication that food was being conveyed from the one house to the other? I did see old Ralph carrying a basket down the garden walk and going in the direction of this house. The idea of food didn't occur to me at that moment. Did you make any local inquiries? Yes, I did. I spoke to the station master and the innkeeper. I simply asked if they knew anything of my old comrade, Godfrey Emsworth. Both of them assured me that he'd gone for a voyage round the world. You said nothing of your suspicions? Nothing. Yet you say you had seen your friend's face quite clearly at the window. So clearly that you're sure of his identity. I have no doubt about it, whatever. The lamplight shone full upon him. It could have been someone resembling him? No, no, it was he. But you say he was changed? Only in color. His face was... How shall I describe it? It was of a fish belly whiteness. It was bleached. All over? I, I think not. It was his brow that I saw so clearly. It was pressed against the window. Very well, Mr. Dodd. The matter should certainly be inquired into. I will go back with you to Tuxbury Old Park today. As it happens, I'm clearing up another matter at the moment. I also have a rather important commission from the Sultan of Turkey to attend to. Let us say at the beginning of next week. I shall be ready whenever you are, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I shall also ask an old friend of mine to accompany us. It is possible that his presence may be entirely unnecessary. On the other hand, it may be essential. But there is no need at the present stage to go further into the matter. The narratives of my friend Watson have shown, no doubt, that I do not waste words or disclose my thoughts while a case is under consideration. In fact, my case was practically complete. When, the next week, we arrived at the strange old rambling house, I asked the elderly friend who had accompanied us to remain in the carriage unless we summons him. I had not introduced him to Dodd, who seemed surprised, but asked no questions. The old butler, Ralph, opened the doors to us. He wore the conventional costume of black coat and pepper and salt trousers, with only one curious variant. He had on brown leather gloves. He shuffled them off at the sight of us, laying them down on the hall table. I have, as Watson may sometimes have remarked, an abnormally acute set of senses, and a faint but incisive smell was apparent. I contrived to drop my hat on the floor, and, in picking it up, brought my nose within a foot of the gloves. A curious, tarry odor was oozing from them. My case was complete at last. Beg pardon, sir. Mr. Dodd and Mr. Sherlock Holmes to see you, sir. Who the devil tell you? What is the meaning of this? You, sir, have I not told you, you infernal busybody, never dare to show your face here again? If you choose to enter here without my leave, I shall be within my rights if I use violence. And as to you, sir, I extend the same warning to you. I am familiar with your ignoble profession, and I tell you to take your reputed talents to some other field where there is an opening for them. I cannot leave here until I hear from Godfrey's own lips that he is under no restraint. Ralph, telephone at once to the county police and ask the inspector to send up two constables. Tell him, tell him there are burglars in the house. One moment. You must be aware, Mr. Dodd, that Colonel Emsworth is within his rights. We have no legal status within this house. On the other hand, he should recognize that your action is prompted entirely by solicitude for his son. I venture to hope that if I were allowed to have five minutes' conversation with Colonel Emsworth, I could certainly alter his view on the matter. What the devil are you waiting for, Ralph? Ring the police, I say. I'm going, sir. Nothing of the sort. Any police interference would bring about the very catastrophe you're dreading. Stand away from that door. Colonel Emsworth. I'll shoot you, sir. On this page in my notebook, I'm writing just one word. Here you are, sir. Pray read it, and you will know what brought us here. What you... How... How do you know this? It is my business to know things. That is my trade. Then you have forced my hand. If you wish to see Godfrey, you shall. This is your doing, not mine. Mr. Holmes, what does this mean? You shall soon see, Mr. Dodd. Ralph, yes, go down to the garden and tell Mr. Godfrey and Mr. Kent that in five minutes, 
We shall be with them. Very good, sir. Very good. But uh, this is very sudden, Colonel Ensworth. Uh, this will uh, disarrange all our plans. I can't help it, Kent. Our hands have been forced. Can Mr. Godfrey see us now? Yes. He's waiting inside. Good. Follow me, gentlemen. Godfrey, old man. Don't touch me, Jimmy. Don't come near. Uh, why, what? Yes, you may well stare. I don't quite look smart enough for B Squadron now, do I? What's happened? Those white patches on your skin. That's why I don't court visitors. But you seem to have me at a disadvantage. I came down to see if all was well with you. That night you looked into my window and... Old Ralph told me you were there. I couldn't resist taking a peep. After you ran away, I couldn't let the matter rest. I asked Mr. Sherlock Holmes here to help. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, eh? Well, Mr. Holmes, you may as well hear my story, too. If you please, Mr. Emsworth. It won't take long to tell. You remember, Jimmy, that morning fight outside Pretoria on the Eastern Railway Line? You heard I was hit? Yes, I heard about it, but I never got the particulars. And three of us got separated from the rest. Baldy Simpson, Anderson, and I. The other two were killed. I got an elephant bullet through my shoulder. I stuck on my horse, though, and he galloped several miles with me before I must have rolled off in a faint. When I came to, it was night. It was deadly cold. You remember that kind of numb cold that used to come at evening? I do. Deadly. Well, luckily, there was a house nearby. I knew my only hope was to reach it. I've a dim memory of staggering there. There was a large room with many beds in. I just fell onto one of them and passed out. Oh, lucky for you. <laughs> was it? When I woke in the morning, it was as though I'd passed from a world of sanity into a nightmare. Standing in front of me was a dwarf-like man with a huge bulbous head. He was jabbering in Dutch and waving his hands. They were like... like horrible brown sponges. Good heavens. There were others behind him watching me. And as I looked at them, I realized that not one of them was a normal human being. Every one was twisted or swollen or disfigured in some way. And they were laughing at me. Heavens, I can hear them now. You were delirious. I thought so for a moment. Then that little beast laid his horrible, deformed hands on me and began pulling me off the bed. My wound was bleeding, but he went on. He was as strong as a bull. I don't know what he was going to do. But an elderly man suddenly came in and shouted an order in Dutch. The little monster moved away. This is fantastic. It's only too true. Well, the elderly man spoke to me in English. I'm a doctor, he said. That shoulder of yours wants fixing up quickly, but man alive, do you know where you are? A hospital, I said. Yes, he said. The leper hospital. You're lying in a leper's bed. Great Scott. Now you have the truth, Mr. Dodd. But Godfrey, surely this doesn't mean... Well, thanks to the British advance, I was in the general hospital at Pretoria within a week. Uh, apart from my shoulder, I seem to be all right. It wasn't until they got me home and I came here that these terrible signs began to appear on my face. I knew then that I hadn't escaped. What was I to do, Mr. Dodd? We had two servants we could trust completely. There was this house where he could live. And Mr. Kent here, he's a surgeon, was prepared to stay and care for him in secret. Yes, but why? Surely a hospital... Don't would... you see? It would have meant segregation for the rest of his life. To live forever among strangers without any hope or release. Even in these quiet parts, if one word got out, he would have been dragged away to that. Even you had to be kept in the dark, Jimmy. But what I don't understand, Father, is why you've relented now. It was Mr. Sherlock Holmes who forced my hand with this scrap of paper. He wrote one word on it. Leprosy. After that, I realized that if he knew so much, it was safer that he should know it all. So it was. And who knows, but good may come of it. Uh, how? I understand that only you, Mr. Kent, have attended the patient. 
May I ask, sir, if you are an authority on such tropical or semi-tropical complaints? I have the ordinary knowledge of the educated medical man. I have no doubt, sir, that you are fully competent. But I'm sure you will agree that in such a case, a second opinion is valuable. It would have meant pressure being put on us to segregate him. I foresaw the situation. And I brought with us a friend whose discretion may be absolutely trusted. I was able once to do him a professional service. And he is ready to advise as a friend rather than as a specialist. His name is Sir James Saunders. Saunders? He is at present in the carriage outside the door. Then I should be proud, Mr. Holmes. Good. I will ask him to step this way. Meanwhile, Colonel Emsworth, we may perhaps assemble in your study where I could explain my process of thought in this matter. My invariable process starts upon the supposition that when you have eliminated all that which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. As this case was first presented to me, there were three possible explanations for the seclusion or incarceration of this gentleman in an outhouse of his father's mansion. There was the possibility that he was in hiding for a crime, or that he was mad and they wished to avoid an asylum, or that he may have some disease which caused his segregation. I could think of no other adequate explanation. The criminal solution would not bear inspection. No unsolved crime has been reported from this district. If it were some crime not yet discovered, then clearly it would be in the family's interest to send the delinquent abroad rather than keep him concealed at home. Insanity was more plausible. What's that? The presence of the second person in the outhouse suggested a keeper. The fact that he locked the door when he came out strengthened the supposition. On the other hand, this constraint could not be severe, or the young man could not have got loose to have a look at his friend. There remained the third possibility. Rare and unlikely as it was, everything seemed to fit into it. Leprosy is not uncommon in South Africa. Bleaching of the skin is a common result of the disease. By some extraordinary chance, this youth might have contracted it. His people would be placed in a very dreadful position, since they would desire to save him from segregation. Great secrecy would be needed, but he could be allowed some freedom after dark. A devoted medical man, if sufficiently paid, would easily be found to take care of him. You thought the case was the strongest of the three, in fact. So strong that I determined to act as if it were actually proved. When I arrived here and noticed that the gloves worn by Ralph, who carried out the meals, were strongly impregnated with disinfectant, my last doubts were removed. A single word showed you, sir, that the secret was discovered. Yes, I see it now. But tell me, sir, why did you write it down instead of saying it? That was to prove to you that my discretion was to be trusted. I thought as much. I decided you should know it all. Ah, here's the James. Yeah. Well, sir, let us know the worst. It is often my lot to bring ill tidings and seldom good. May this occasion is the more welcome, Colonel Emsworth. It is not leprosy. Not? What is it, Sir James? A well-marked case of pseudo-leprosy. Ichthyosis. It's a scale-like affection of the skin, unsightly and obstinate, but possibly curable and certainly non-infective. Oh, then, heaven be thanked. Surely, if he got it uh, from contact with these leper fellows, then... No, no, not from them. A coincidence, remarkable, but a coincidence. Here it is that I miss my Watson. By cunning questions and ejaculations of wonder, he could elevate my simple art into a prodigy. A confederate who foresees your conclusions and course of action is always dangerous. But one to whom each development comes as a perpetual surprise, and to whom the future is always a closed book, is, indeed, an ideal helpmate. Ah, me... I trust marriage will not change him over much. That was the blanched soldier, the seventh story in our Sherlock Holmes series by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 
Adapted for radio by Michael Hardwick.